Welcome everyone again to the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the human beings behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world uh, and inspiring the future. Uh, I'm Ira Pastor, your health and aging ambassador along for this journey. Uh, today we are going to talk about a fascinating series of topics related to global population health. Uh, and we'll start off by citing some, some really interesting data. Uh, the World Health Organization currently estimates there are around a billion migrants today, uh, 258 million which are international, and 763 million which are internal. Uh, so one in seven of the world's population. Uh, it's estimated that 68 million of them are uh, migrants fleeing uh, or being forcibly displaced. Um, this rapid increase in population movement has important public health implications and requires adequate response from the health sector as many refugee and migrants often lack access to health services and financial protection for their health. Additionally, although we are only 20 years into the 21st century, uh, it is a century that has already been marked by many major epidemics around the world. Uh, we see many older diseases like cholera, plague, and yellow fever making returns, and many new ones emerging such as SARS, MERS, Ebola, Zika, and the issue of, you know, of both migrant health and these epidemics and their impact on global health require that the world's governments work together in a collective and coordinated manner to address the mounting public health issues as they are truly, we'll say, transnational in nature. So to go further into these areas, I'm truly honored to say that we are joined today by Ambassador Juan Jose Gomez Camacho, Mexico's current ambassador to Canada, and for the last three years, Mexico's permanent representative to the United Nations in New York City. Ambassador Gomez Camacho is a career diplomat since 1998 who has held many different positions within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and abroad, among them ambassador to the European Union, Belgium, and Luxembourg. Uh, ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations and other international organizations based in Geneva, Switzerland, and ambassador to Singapore, Myanmar, and Brunei Dar es Salaam. Ambassador Gomez Camacho holds a master's degree in international law from Georgetown University and has broad experience and is a negotiator in bilateral and multilateral fields in topics as varied as political affairs, human rights, telecommunications, and both nuclear and conventional disarmament. Uh, in his role as permanent representative of Mexico to the United Nations, he was designated by the President of the United Nations General Assembly as co-facilitator for the negotiation of the Global Deal to make migration safe, orderly, and regular, yielding the Global Compact on Migration. Uh, during his posting in Geneva uh, as the representative of Mexico to the UN, he held a prominent role in the landmark agreement and multilateral negotiations, including the World Health Organization Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework, as well as WIPO Marrakesh VIP Treaty to facilitate access to public works for persons who are blind or visually impaired or print disabled, and the creation of the first special procedure within the UN Human Rights Council on the elimination of discrimination against women in law and practice. I also had the pleasure of serving with the Ambassador on the World Economic Forum's Human Enhancement Council. Uh, Ambassador Gomez Camacho, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today. It's a pleasure, Ira. Thank you so much. Uh, so, you know, we typically start out by just uh, giving our guests the floor for a bit to introduce themselves. If you could just talk a little bit about your background, how you got interested in law, uh, public service, and then ultimately your path to these sort of the last 30 years of being the epicenter of, of global diplomacy. Well, um, I, I have to start very young. Uh, the foreign service has been, in reality, my only proper job. I started when I was 20. 23 years of age, even while studying still the last part of my my degree uh, in law, and as as many other uh, diplomats or most of diplomats around the world, uh, what brings us to to the foreign services is our commitment to our countries that we believe that uh, service is important to improve the situation of the countries, and that doing that abroad is very important. So that's what I have been doing. And second, uh, because of Mexico's global vocation, because of Mexico's total belief and commitment to a rules-based international 
international order is that me and other Mexican colleagues have have been uh, very involved in global governance issues, uh, not only putting Mexico's voice, but also Mexico's leadership, and as, as we did in migration, health, environment, and many other issues where Mexican diplomats have played uh, a very central role. So that's, that's basically what I've been doing that has been has motivated uh, my role all my life. And now is what I do here as ambassador to Canada. So, you know, regarding to the topic of, of migration, obviously this is a topic that has been, you know, here in, you know, I sit in the U.S. And for the last several years, it's been in the public mind, but as obviously this is a, a small piece of sort of what's going on in, in the bigger picture around the world. As mentioned, you know, there's hundreds of millions of migrants living outside uh, their countries. Uh, all over the world, the figure is expected to be growing for a variety of different reasons in terms of population growth, inequality, demographics, climate change, and so forth. Um, and you know, there's, there's nonetheless, there's amazing you know potential opportunities, benefits for migrants and host communities, uh, as well as the communities of origin. Um, you know, obviously, when poorly regulated, it cre creates a lot of challenges. Um, you were very integral in putting together. Uh, uh, the Global Compact for Migration, which was the first intergovernmental agreement uh, prepared under the United Nations to cover all aspects of international migration in this holistic, comprehensive manner. Can you talk a little bit about the, the compact? Uh, and then also just, you know, in general, the, the very importance of both uh, the physical and mental health of migrants and the communities, because, you know, when one in seven people in the world is moving around, this requires obviously uh, some serious intergovernmental uh, work, uh, which you have been in the middle of. Can you talk a little bit about this? Um, well, uh, for decades, um, well, first, migration has always existed and will always exist. However, um, since the UN was established, despite efforts by many um, countries, very much in the center of my own, Mexico, the UN refused, or, or rather the majority of member states to the UN, refused the idea that the organization should deal with migration. In other words, refused the idea or rejected the idea of putting what they perceived as their sovereign right to write their own immigration laws, which is totally true, is right, that's the way it is. It's a sovereign right that we all have and cherished. Uh, to put it, as they perceived, on the table for negotiation within the organization. Um, however, after decades of um, an overwhelming clear reality, on the one hand, the, the phenomenon keeps, is there and grows, um, increasing understanding, uh, uh, if you like, and a lot of very good diplomacy. We finally, all member states, concluded that it was just about time to try to put together a, let's call it, a global understanding on, on, on migration, how to handle these global phenomenon, what its objectives should be, and in other words, to put together some sort of governance uh, issues uh, around migration, and all this to achieve what we all want on migration, whether you can be placed as pro-migration or less favorable to migration, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we all agree that what we want is to make migration safe, orderly, and regular. And these three objectives, in opposition to the two, uh, uh, unsafe, irregular, and disorderly migration. So once we understood that disorderly unsafe and irregular migration is not good, is not good for the people themselves, and is not good for the societies, both origin and destination, and is not 
good for countries is when we manage to sit together and construct what it became the global compact for safe orderly and regular migration and and its content its, its um, spirit or, or, or what it what it has uh, uh, what it produces is a um, let's say a set of commitments very clear commitments objectives that we all regardless of which part of the migration role we play, whether we are countries of origin, transit, or destination, have to promote and to achieve these objectives. And in order to do so, each of these objectives has very specific, let's say, policy measures that uh, serve both as guidelines, if you like, to countries, but also as tools uh, to these countries that can be adapted to each country's reality. There, uh, there is not the same challenge or, 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 or between or migration between a rich country of destination and a poor country of origin. The challenges are different. The policy measures have to be different. But both together at the end have to pursue the same objective, how we make migration safe, orderly and regular. So uh, the, the global compact is the result of this effort and this is what it contains. And it also uh, does something uh, critical in the migration uh, debate in order to, to provide some global coherence to the phenomenon, which is to create um, political spaces within the UN, institutional spaces within the UN, where countries need to sit together to formally discuss migration, to formally discuss how to address it, and above all, to formally discuss and debate how are we implementing uh, the Global Compact successfully. So in a capsule, this is what it is. As aside from the Compact, you've also been involved in many other uh, sort of these transnational initiatives, and one extremely important one uh, was your involvement in the World Health Organization uh, pandemic uh, preparedness framework for influenza, which you know involved once again bringing together member states, uh, laboratories, companies, other group, civil society groups to really prepare, you know, for, in, in that particular case, influenza, but I, I guess it applies in many ways to any, any potential pandemic. Um, obviously, uh, vaccination is an important defense, but many countries do not have the ability to develop their own vaccines. Um, it takes a long time to develop vaccines for newly emerging problems. Could you, could you once again talk about a little bit about your experience in this area? Obviously, you know, viruses and, and, yeah. and microbes do not obey borders. <laughs> um, yeah. And once again, this is not a Mexico issue. It's not a Switzerland issue. It's everybody's issue. Could you talk a little bit about the invo your involvement in sort of sure. putting all of this together? It's very sure. important. Sure. Uh, well, first, let me let me refer quickly because I forgot uh, to the issue of health on, on, uh, for migrants or migration. The Global Compact contains uh, commitments and policies precisely on health, uh, um, not only because it's a question of rights, basic fundamental rights of everybody to have access to health, but also um, because health is sort of a public good that needs to be protected for social and economic reasons in addition to the human rights element. So what the Global Compact does on health is to ensure that regardless of the legal or immigration status of migrants, once they have entered the country, regularly or irregularly, they always have to have access to basic health. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is uh, an important step forward provided by the Global Compact. On the pandemic uh, issue, yes, um, after the um, influenza pandemic, the H1N1, uh, H1N1 pandemic uh, in 2009, uh, where 
the reaction of the international community was extremely chaotic, in which each country decided to take its own measures uh, to get its own access to vaccines or diagnostic kits. kits. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies began to produce as they could um, uh, vaccines and these kits and to sell them to whomever, to whomever could buy them. Uh, so, so the reaction, because it was so disordered and chaotic, it was totally ineffective. For example, uh, back to the issue of vaccines uh, and kits, these were being sold to countries, for example, that could pay for them, but were not yet victims of the pandemic. Instead of sending these to the countries where the pandemic was already happening, so you could stop the progress of the virus. Uh, so the idea that the main uh, objective of this whole system that we constructed uh, in WHO was basically to ensure that in case of a potential pandemic or a pandemic uh, phenomenon, we would have, countries would have a coherent, well-organized reaction based on epidemiologic criteria and not in panic or on panic. Mm -hmm. uh, so as to vaccines, for example, to go to the places where they need to go, so you stop the progress of the vaccine, or to make sure that countries that could not afford them can have access to or to ensure that the pharmaceutical companies would have access to the candidate viruses or the, the, the biological material to produce the vaccines on time, but also would commit to donate vaccines so they can go through WHO to countries that could not afford uh, uh, to buy them, or that all the very specific, well-designated countries could have access to the know-how to develop the vaccines on time, uh, in addition to what the pharma, uh, pharmaceutical industry would do commercially. So all these um, required a very, very complex, very technical, very uh, political negotiation amongst countries, um, and also the pharmaceutical industry that uh, joined us in the process. And my role there was to preside over these these negotiations to to put the pieces together and what I did at the time which was very important and, and controversial uh, in the eyes of many many actors was precisely to bring the pharmaceutical industry to work with us uh, in the political process within WHO because without the pharmaceutical industry participating it was simply impossible to ensure success and the pharmaceutical companies were were very constructive. Um, they learned with us. We all learned together how to to do this process. We also understood each other much better. Companies and governments. Companies understood that governments were not in the business of hurting business, mm -hmm. but rather to make sure that um, uh, companies could operate. Um, in a satisfactory, successful way, both doing business and while doing business, because we need them to be successful, we need them to be robust, we need them to be profitable and, 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 and effective. Uh, they also have to or are able to help in controlling these pandemics, in avoiding these pandemics, or if they happened in, in stopping them um, by producing the right uh, vaccines by producing them in a way that they are affordable, that they can reach the people they need to, it, need to, or it needs to be reached. And all this was put in a very complex package, which is precisely this negotiation. And since then, now we have a system, an international multilateral system in place 
that enables every actor around or that has to do something uh, when a pandemic a pandemic breaks or can break uh, to operate in a coordinated manner in a very coherent way and always uh, in a very uh, a well-structured way and always following epidemiologic uh, criteria instead of just chaos and disorder. And, and I have to say, it was a very, very successful negotiation and an innovative one. You know, working along that same you know, model, uh, you know, it, it brings me into my next question. And, you know, obviously I had the, the honor of meeting you through the uh, World uh, Economic Forum's Human Enhancement Group. And, you know, we, we had a, a fairly mixed group there, but, you know, I think the underlying point was, you know, whether we were talking about Mexico or the U.S. or Switzerland or Abu Dhabi or a variety of the different countries that represented, uh, the fact is that all of our populations are in 2019, you know, you know rapidly aging, um, presenting, you know, once again, challenges and opportunities. Um, and, and once again, you know, just like you, you were mentioning, uh, you know, there's going to be increased demands for different primary health care needs, long-term care, uh, different age-friendly environments. And these, once again, you know, uh, this is not for one company or, or one hospital. Or, or these are integrated worldwide issues. Could you just talk a little bit because you know you 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 were joint you were in the group as somebody that understood sort of the the broader picture. Can you talk a little bit how organizations, how diplomacy, how groups like the UN um, can you know play a role in this issue of a you know society, a global society that is substantially going to be changing. Uh, you know, we talk about healthy aging, but at the same time, you know, it's happening everywhere. And if you could just talk a little bit about your thoughts on uh, the importance of organizations uh, in, in the diplomatic sphere to participate in this healthy aging, looking forward the next 10, 20 years uh, issue that we all have in front of us. Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, increasingly, the human being and, and even if it sounds strange when I say increasingly, but it is the case, increasingly, uh, the human being is becoming the center of the diplomatic work and the diplomatic activity, whether it is multilateral or otherwise bilateral or regional. It, it, it is the person, is it, it, much less or, or rather not only focused on the interest of states in a more traditional way, peace, security, and, and others. It is now the person. Um, and since it is the person, also increasingly the role of international organizations, whatever uh, organization you can think of, public organizations I'm talking about, like uh, the UN or the World Bank or all these ones, is about making developing public policy, sort of an international public policy to address the challenges of the individual, the challenges of the person, the human being, and the societies and communities. With this logic, today we see a huge number of areas where diplomacy is very active and very productive, areas that deal with the person. Overall, I would say that today what what serves as a sort of an umbrella of every effort, or is trying to become an umbrella of every effort, is the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, or of the Sustainable Development Goals, that it was adopted by the UN in 2015, that tries to provide a roadmap for every country in the world to move towards ensuring a sustainable development. And sustainable development requires, amongst other things, health. Now, e even before this agenda existed in, or was adopted in 2015, health, exactly for the reasons you have explained, became or has become a central part of global efforts. Now, increasingly, you see... Um, health diplomacy at play. Health, now there is such a thing as health diplomacy, where diplomats, not only health experts, 
but diplomats are deeply engaged in finding solutions uh, to health challenges. Why? Again, because of the reasons you have explained. So now it wouldn't surprise you that in the UN agenda, in the global agenda, G7, G20, the UN, uh, uh, the World Bank, everywhere, health um, or health topics are there. Let me give you examples. One is the pandemic that you mentioned. Uh, pandemic has a global. Ch it it poses uh, poses a global threat. Another that one that you might remember, we negotiated a couple of years ago. I also had the pleasure to the honor to chair that negotiation was on AMR, mm. antimicrobial resistance, as another right. serious, serious, massive threat to global security. The, the this 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 issue of of. Uh, uh, Bacteria uh, becoming um, uh, resistant, uh, viruses becoming resistant to, to antibiotics, bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics. So infections now becoming, being mortal again or life threatening again as, as they were a hundred years ago. Uh, well, uh, chronic diseases or non communicable diseases, which is constant part of the global agenda. Why? Again, because of the reasons you explained, we are at a time where life expectancy is expanding, but at the same time, people are acquiring uh, or, or getting uh, uh, ill with chronic diseases or mm -hmm. non-communicable diseases, which, for example, are uh, or heart diseases or gastro diseases or diabetes, diseases that are not killing people immediately or that people are uh, living longer with these diseases. They live longer lives now because of the life expectancy, but they are becoming, I don't know, having suffering from a heart disease at a younger age, at 40 or at 50 or diabetic at 30, at 40, at 50. And this implies that or, or entails a massive economic cost for the state because you have to support um, with health these people for many more years, for much longer time. And at the same time, uh, uh, these people have to leave jobs to be taken care of in a, by a doctor or in health or a health facility or they, they have to leave jobs permanently or so so there is a double cost here one is the cost of providing health and the cost of reducing productivity and if we don't change the curve of this phenomenon in just few years, there will be no health budget able to cope with all this. And I'm not talking about small, middle income or poor countries. I'm talking about also big, wealthy, rich, developed countries. Uh, so in order for us in our countries to address these huge health challenges, we, as in many other areas, need to work together with other countries to find common solutions, collective solutions. So through the multilateral system, we've been creating tools, measures, public policies, agreements, cooperation, and so on and so forth, that collectively are allowing us to address these, these phenomena. And demographics is it's a very, very serious challenge. It's a very, very clear, important reality more dramatic in developed countries than in developing countries. Developed countries are aging, are aging very fast. Uh, I think there is no developed country today other than probably the U.S., and this is because of migration, that is replacing itself or that the birth rate is either at the level of replacement or a bit ahead. The rest are below replacement. 
So if you see Europe, you see countries in Europe that the, the, the future looks very dramatic because they are not only aging, they are not only not replacing themselves, but in fact they are already shrinking population-wise, which when you see countries that from, let's say, in 10 years or in 20 years, in absolute numbers, will have a smaller population than the one they have now, is very dramatic. And the economic challenge of that is really, really enormous. So, yes, this is a very central issue also globally, regionally, and bilaterally. Migration is a tool. That's why migration is happening. That's why many countries, regardless of the rhetoric and the narrative and the global uh, discussion uh, on this, countries are trying to attract human capital because otherwise it will be absolutely impossible to deal with them. Uh, I'm in Canada now where I serve, as you know, as you, as, as, as you mentioned. And Canada has a very interesting uh, uh, immigration policy that is, I think is a very smart one, well organized, that allows them to precisely bring the human capital every year that they need. And they are uh, absorbing an average of 350,000 people every year to compensate for the lack of um, uh, uh, population growth because people are aging, because they are below the replacement uh, level and therefore they, they need people. Uh, so, yes, all this, what shows uh, finally, is that all these phenomena are completely interconnected. And we need a comprehensive, horizontal, well-integrated solutions to address them all. So if you see that we deal with migration, or the Agenda 2030, or health, or economic issues, you will see that we were, we've been trying to weave them together to connect them uh, together so they all pursue the same and they all interact with each other. They all, meaning these measures, reinforce each other because everything is interconnected. That's, uh, thank you for that. that that's a, uh, a, a sobering and, out, and, and really outstanding uh, you know, analysis of what's going on and uh, in the, 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 the topic, the, 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 the term uh, health diplomacy makes <laughs> so much more sense in, in that, uh, in that yeah. context. Um, you know, w w one last question, and this, this gets back just to a little more personal towards you. Obviously, you've, uh, you've had a, an amazing career uh, for the last uh, few decades um, and met, uh, obviously, many different uh, leaders around the world, thought leaders, uh, other diplomats, and so forth. Um, this final question is just about uh, people that have influenced you uh, during your career. Um, have there been specific people along the way that uh, that you may want to, I guess, give a shout out to here? That uh, you know, if it wasn't for them, you may have <laughs> decided to uh, to not do this anymore and go into into the private sector or, or do something totally different uh, during the decades that you've been involved in. In, uh, international diplomacy. Yeah, well, I, I think difficult to single anybody out. I mean, uh, so many people. Sure. It's not only so many people, but it's the um, what diplomacy gives you is also the chance to look through the window and to see everything together and how big the challenges are. No? Uh, because fr from from diplomacy and global diplomacy. Um, you, you can see the big picture in a way that it's very difficult to see it from the very exclusively national perspective. The national perspective, we, we see our parcel, our, our, our little bit of the bigger phenomenon. And, and we easily lose the, 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 this uh, reality or, the, the, or we, we don't grasp this reality that our little problem or our big problem in reality belongs to a larger one. And that the only solution, therefore, has to be in a larger way working with others. And when you are in diplomacy, you have this enormous privilege and challenge, of course, to see the full, the full mosaic together. You know? And I think that what drives us, most of all that do this and inspires, inspires us 
uh, to keep doing it because we, again, we 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 have this rare privilege of seeing the full picture together. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, it's, it's been a, a pleasure and an honor to, to have you on the show today, uh, spreading your knowledge in, in, in all of these areas, which are clearly major challenges for the world. But, uh, you know, when to hear that people like yourselves are out there thinking, you know, across borders, transnationally, uh, it, it's, uh, it's very inspiring. And, um, you know, it, it opens up a view on things that many of us like me that sit in the, the private sector don't always see. But uh, clearly, uh, you know, thanking you. Are, by the way, I see a private sector is evolving very fast. Oh, yeah. Towards this aligning themselves towards this logic, and, and it's really fascinating and nice. For, for everybody listening today, uh, we have been honored to be joined by Ambassador Juan Jose Gomez Camacho, Mexico's current ambassador to Canada, previously Mexico's permanent representative to the United Nations. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time today and everything that uh, you do on the diplomacy front. Great pleasure.